we're here two days before the busiest cannabis holiday of the year, right? 420 coming up, uh, where we see a crush of traffic uh, on the retail side of things. Uh, everyone's out buying. I was over at Barbary Coast earlier, and it was crazy. Uh, not one of our customers, hopefully soon. Um, but yeah, I, I realize these events attract a wide range of attendees, and I kind of want to get a sense for the crowd here. Um, who here, and just show of hands, uh, who here is a product person, product manager, PM, something like that? A few, okay. Uh, where are the designers in the crowd? Okay, a lot of designers, good stuff. Uh, any engineers? Okay, a couple here and there. Uh, what about uh, uh, other, I guess? Uh, none of those. <laughs> Didn't mean to lump you in that category. Okay, cool. Um, how many of you work in cannabis here? Oh, good number, okay, cool. Um, so I might not be telling those who just raised your hand something, but uh, maybe for the rest of y'all, I hope to offer you a new perspective on cannabis. Um, tonight, I hope you walk away with some information on the state of legal cannabis, uh, not only in California, but nationwide. Um, I'd like to maybe educate y'all about the opportunities in this space and maybe get you excited for those not working in cannabis to come join our cause, come work with us. Um, so first, who am I and why the hell am I up here talking to you? Um, well, that's me. Uh, I've definitely been a geek for a long time. Um, still working on the designer part. Uh, that's me in 1995, uh, running a BBS and trying to draw comic books, which I was really, really bad at. Um, I've worked at a variety of companies. I worked at Hewlett Packard when I was 17, went through the whole dot-com boom and bust, uh, founded my own consultancy in 2000, and started a company called Cashboard, uh, which helps small businesses in 2006. Today, um, I'm the principal designer at Greenbits, um, and over there I'm trying to build a strong product team, um, doing an okay job, hopefully. Um, handle design research, strategy, design systems, which uh, a lot of the designers in the crowd probably are also familiar with, uh, and do a lot of lean product validation. I've uh, been there since 2017, uh, so coming into, I think, my third year now. Um, and, well, those of who don't know, um, What's GreenBits? Um, well, we kind of know a thing or two about running successful cannabis operations. Um, we have 1,100 uh, locations nationwide and growing. Um, we processed a quarter of all transactions in legal cannabis last year. Uh, we launched 2015 in Washington uh, with the BioTrack system that was there. Any of you all know what BioTrack is? Okay, good, this is, this is gonna be good then. Um, we have 88 employees and 40% of the market share for retail point of sale in states that have seed to sale tracking. Um, we will be in all 33 legal states by the end of this year. So, um, all that said, um, I'd like to take you all on a little quick journey of legal cannabis growth in America. Uh, here was the state of legal cannabis in 2012. A lot of red, a lot of prohibited states, right? Um, we had two that were recreational, uh, Washington and Colorado, uh, and, and a bunch that were medical, or a handful that are medical. So fast forward to today, uh, and that map changes drastically. Um, so you see limited medical even in states uh, like Texas, um, and you see recreational growing across the board. Uh, so it's not, a, it's not all like California. I know y'all probably have limited experience here. Another show of hands, who's been actually into a dispensary? Okay, good, 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 good. <laughs> um, yeah, so we all know getting high is pretty fun, uh, but I think it's a little bit deeper than that. Um, who here drinks? Okay, a lot of people. Who here smokes or consumes cannabis? Sorry, not smokes, we have so many different products. Okay, um, has anyone given up Drinking for consuming cannabis? Any, any hands? Okay, a couple here and there. Um, so for me, uh, I really find it interesting that uh, you're starting to see headlines like this as cannabis rolls out nationwide. Uh, opioid use lower in states that ease marijuana laws. Alcohol sales dropping 15% in states with medical marijuana laws. And binge drinking dropping in states with recreational marijuana laws. Sorry, I should probably speak into the mic, huh? Um, and I think we're just at the beginning of this movement. Um, this next election cycle, it's going to be huge. Um, as you see Democrats rallying, uh, using this really as an election kind of um, rally cry, right? Um, I think uh, reducing harm and racial disparity is uh, gonna be key as well. Uh, releasing nonviolent offenders uh, across the country, you're starting to see a lot of that in the East Coast states as well. Um, Resources won't be wasted on cannabis demonization anymore. 
And I think we're only scratching the surface of the uh, complex cannabinoids and how they can benefit us, as, as we saw earlier with all the range of products, right? Um, so cannabis is, is gaining social acceptance nationally, uh, but I think that's only the first step. And uh, as designers, we know that challenges are opportunities in disguise. I think there are a lot more challenges to be solved. And so what might some of those be? Um, what might be some opportunities that we have in cannabis? A anyone, any ideas for designers, especially since there are a number of us? Ideas? You're all shy, okay. Education, okay. I saw a hand over here. Packaging design, that's a great one. So yeah, a lot, of, a lot of business to consumer design opportunities, right? There's branding, there's product development, there's education uh, for patients and recreational customers. There's on-site consumption lounges and event planning, like we saw earlier, right? Um, this is kind of my favorite package design, the Dosist uh, brand, which you saw the entire shop. I think it's super clean. It looks, you know, uh, to me like an Apple product, right? Very like, uh, sets off my uh, minimalist fetishism, I guess. I'm just like, oh, it's so beautiful. Uh, <laughs> but uh, what about B2B opportunities? Um, not many of us, I think, are thinking about that. So I'd like to expand your mind and maybe uh, have you explore some of those possibilities. Um, running a business, especially a small business, is already really, really hard, right? H has anyone tried to run a small business and, and succeeded or failed here? Freelance? Okay. Hands, 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 hands. It's really hard. I've, I've run a number of businesses. Uh, most of them have failed. Uh, one was a pretty decent success, and I've had moderate success here and there. So really, really tough. Um, the moment you add cannabis to your business, uh, that multiplies all of your challenges. It becomes exponentially more difficult to run a profitable business and one that uh, keeps you safe. So uh, what are some of the unique challenges facing legal cannabis? Uh, cannabis federally is still a schedule one drug. Um, so that means you can't carry it across state lines. You can't get a bank account. Um, more often than not, can't accept electronic payments. You have to hire security firms and move cash around and all those other things, right? Um, on top of that, state and federal agencies are watching everything like the eye of Sauron. They're looking for you to screw up so that they can fine you, take your license away, maybe put you in jail. Um, so uh, with that in mind, how might we make running a cannabis business like every other retail operation take some of that pain away? Another show of hands. Are you sensing a theme where, there, where there's a hand? I ask you to raise your hand. Um, <laughs> who knows about cannabis compliance here? Okay, seed to sale tracking, all of that stuff. A little bit, a little bit. Okay, um, seed to sale tracking. Compliance is composed of three different things. So the first is seed to sale tracking. Um, and seed to sale tracking enables regulation and enforcement of a secure supply chain, com complete with real-time accountability. So what that does is ensure that the uh, state and local regu regulators can look uh, what you have, where you have it, how much of it you have, where it's going. Um, it's also uh, a big part of easing the public's fears that this stuff's not going to fall into the black market. How effective that is, I don't know. Uh, government just likes to be in everyone's business, personally, I think. Um, the next step of that compliance pillar would be product testing. Um, this one I, I believe a lot more in, right? Um, with this uh, public testing um, or product testing of cannabis, we can uh, earn the public's trust by ensur ensuring products are safe to consume. We're also helping inform consumers of specific cannabinoids and their effects, um, which is great, right? You, you can go buy something and it's not like you're buying uh, the bag of weed from your friend down the street that says it's fire and you're going to get really fucked up, right? You, you can sleep or you can have energy or, you know, the, the myriad of other uh, effects. And I think that's only going to continue to grow and testing is a huge part of that. Um, the last uh, compliance pillar would be compliance sales. So uh, with all this tracking, the uh, government uh, wants to ensure that cannabis isn't falling into unauthorized consumers' hands, right? Um, so that happens through age verification and transaction limits. Um, the fun thing is that besides product testing, well, actually even product testing, the rules around all of these things vary depending what state you're in. So if you know the laws in California and you know the regulations and you make a product that serves California, you go to Maryland, your product doesn't work there. Uh, it's kind of hard. So uh, cannabis business owners face severe penalties for violating regulations. Anyone know what that thing is or am I like super old and geeky? Okay, it's ED-209, right? Uh, from RoboCop. Um, 
Yeah, so here is an example of uh, an extreme violation that happened in Denver, Colorado, where the owners of Sweet Leaf got a year in jail uh, each. Uh, huge fines, lost their license, a lot of their bud tenders got arrested, all their sh stores shut down because they were selling using a practice called looping. Uh, looping essentially is, so in Colorado they have daily transaction limits or per transaction limits where you have to go in and you can buy only a specified amount of cannabis. Um, they were skirting that rule. So someone was coming in, buying some weed, going in the parking lot, waiting an hour, coming back, buying some more weed, repeat, right? Uh, and the owners were onto this, knew it was happening, let it happen. That's why they went to jail. Um, that's a really extreme case. Um, some more common penalties where uh, ED-209 is kind of a friendly little toy here. Um, fines up to $10,000 per day if you violate some of these things for uh, store owners. Uh, license suspensions, uh, you can get your license revoked as well. So um, you need to know compliance and you need to understand that if you're gonna operate a cannabis business. Now, I'm not even gonna talk about labeling and packaging concerns, which also differ state to state. Fragile uh, government technology, APIs that go down, um, or perplexing tax codes like here in California that a math major can only understand. What I am gonna talk about is seed to sell tracking. So, um, I've been thinking about this problem for the last couple years or so. Um, seed to sell tracking has three big players nationwide. You have Metric, you have BioTrack, and you have Leaf Data Systems. Uh, metric being the largest uh, across the country. So, how's it work? Um, I'm gonna show you a workflow. When uh, cannabis is planted, uh, it gets a number. So here, you could say it's 001, right? When, the, and there you go. Um, each plant actually has that number attached to it in metric states, that's an RFID tag hanging from it. So an auditor can come in, wave their magic wand, scan all of the plants in the facility and know where they are, right? So, oh, we have 16 of these, 12 of those, 20 of these, everything looks good, right? When those plants are harvested, um, there are lots of other numbers that can happen, right? So each harvest gets its uh, own number, unique number. So the, again, the government can track it. The government's looking at this through a state portal every step of the way, right? So uh, you harvest some flour, that gets 002. You harvest some flour, it becomes materials. And they have different classifications, so that's why I'm showing all the uh, different names there becomes 003, you waste some things, um, becomes 004, and then you have to actually take a dis destruction action on that waste that again is recorded to the government. You can't just throw away the weed. You have to mix it with dirt in front of a camera and set it on fire and do a dance and a spell and everything else. Uh, it's really, really crazy. So um, here's a harvest, again, that metric tag attached to it, right? Uh, this is at one of our customers' uh, operations in Colorado. Um, once it's harvested and packaged, uh, some go into production, right? You need to extract um, oil, you need to maybe repackage it into smaller uh, batches so it can be ready for sale. Uh, something like this, uh, one of our customers weighing out a uh, product to, to repackage it. After that, uh, it gets moved on to retail shops. Every step of the way, these, the government's tracking these things. Every step of the way, it gets a new number, so the government can track it. Um, this is all really complicated stuff, right? Uh, who is doing this? Are they doing it manually? Are they writing these things down? Some people are, if, if you don't um, have a system to help you with it. Um, and that, again, when it comes into the store, looks like this. These tags follow it along. They have to be stored with the product and, and tracked along the way. So when that government agent comes in and says, hey, show me all of... 1A4013, blah, 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 13, uh, where is it? You can show them and say, oh, I have 20 of these, I have 10 of those, we're good, right? Um, even when that gets sold to you, um, that gets tracked as well. And even some states don't call it sales because they believe it's against their uh, state code, they call it transfers. Like I talked to a compliance officer in Colorado who said, we're not actually selling the cannabis to people, um, they're exchanging money for it and we're transferring it to their possession. <laughs> don't, don't say sale. We're not actually selling weed. Um, and you know, it happens in, in shops like this, really beautiful, uh, beautifully designed shops. This is one uh, of our customers in Maryland. Um, 
and you know you end up with products like this. Um, this anyone know what this? Oh, that's that's not an exit bag. Actually, I I didn't have the right picture. So sometimes it even shows up in a child safe bag that you can't walk out of the store with, right? So God forbid someone gets their hands on uh, on cannabis, right? Or you can actually get to it to smoke it or eat it or whatever you want to do with it. <laughs> um, yeah, now imagine every step of this process has to be reported to the government uh, in real time, accurately, so you don't get fined or go to jail. Kind of scary, right? <laughs> um, so, you know, we think a lot about how might we normalize this experience for folks? Well, uh, one way we, we can do that is through software, um, providing automation, full transparency, and control to our customers. Um, what you're looking at here is a uh, product that we offer called State Link. Um, this communicates with all of the state um, tracking systems automatically. It shows you the um, process of what's going on. You made a sale, a transfer, a close. Was it successful? Did it fail? Um, and gives you resolution tools to fix some of those things that have gone on. Because imagine you did a split, um, split you know, um, what took one, two, three, I packaged some grams and then some ounces you have to actually uh, record that as well, right? So if, or if I split it to return to a vendor or split it to uh, transfer to another shop, government wants to know about that. Well, what if you type in this number, this really long number, wrong? That, that's a failure, and then you can't report your sales automatically. What if you go on the state website and you type that number in wrong? Another failure, right? So you, you, they really set it up so you can trip yourself up here. Um, Let's talk about compliance sale enforcement. How might we prevent another sweet leaf situation from happening, right? This one may be a bad case because the owners knew actually what was happening, but uh, what other tools might we be able to provide these uh, businesses that help them maintain their compliant uh, sales status? Well, maybe when you know, a customer comes through the door, we can check their information with a state system or our system to let our customers know hey, this person came in 24 hours uh, ago or so and they bought some stuff. You might not want to sell to them again. You might want to check their transaction limits. Or when we sell to them on the point of sale, uh, if they go over that limit, we might want to show them how much they purchased uh, and they're going over. So, oh man, looks like this guy's buying uh, too, much, too much vape concentrate. We probably want to take that item out of their cart, right? So the bud tender doesn't get in trouble. Store owner maintains their compliance. These are just a couple of things. Um, and there are many, many more. Uh, I could go on about this stuff forever, but let's talk about some future challenges that might be coming up. What changes when these businesses operate in multiple geographies, right? Um, you have a, a business in California and one in Nevada. You have one in Maryland, but also in Michigan. Um, how do you stay on top of this stuff, right? What happens when we can actually finally transfer products between state lines and between state systems? How do you make metric talk to leave to bio track to this and that? What's the translation process like? No one knows that yet, that we still have to discover and figure all that stuff out. Um, this is only gonna continue. So this is from a couple days ago. Um, the largest US marijuana dispensary even uh, got bigger. Harvest Health and Recreation um, has 70 retail stores, 13 grow farms, 13 processing facilities in 16 states. How are they gonna run an operation like that? You're definitely gonna see what we're calling internally Canacorp, right? Um, these giant conglomerations of uh, cannabis retailers. Um, but how might we give mom and pop boutique shops the power to compete with those big cannabis operations, right? And put people on equal footing. I think that's really important as well. So we uh, don't just enable others to railroad and steamroll the industry, right? Um, if anyone else is interested in those type of things, we're hiring, come talk to me. I need designers, I need engineers, I need product people. Um, and thanks for your time, I really appreciate it.